Hello students, welcome back to your English class. Today we are going to take a new poem. All the world's, all the world says stage. Okay, this is an excerpt from Sh William Shakespeare's As You Like It. Here the poet refers the world as a stage, and all the men and women are the players in the stage. Okay. and in their life every man and every man and woman plays seven roles in their life according to their age okay let us read the poem all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players they have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts his acts been seven ages at first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms and then the waning schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school and then the lover sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress ibo then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard jealous in honor sudden and quick in quarrel seeking the bubble reputation even in the canon's mouth and then the justice in fair round belly with good cap and lined with eyes severe and beard of formal cut full of wise sauce and modern instances and so he plays his part the sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side his youthful hoofs well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in a sound last scene of all that ends with strange and eventful history is taken childishness childishness and more oblivion sans teeth sans eyes sans taste sans everything children actually this is a play of this is an expert excerpt from the play of willing shakespeare the play is as you like it and here he refers the world as a stage and all the men and women are the players in it and how many roles they play in their life the roles seven so they play seven roles in their life and let us see what are they first is first role is an is as an infant infant means small baby when he is helpless in his mother's arms okay looks in the nurse's arms next is the school boy so it refers as a child that means the childhood days second role is the child first one is infant second is child is a child who goes creeping like snail unwilling to unwillingly to school he is innocent and he is not willing to learn anything okay he wants he wants freedom so for learning he must lose his child liberty the next stage is of a lover and he will do anything to please his beloved ones he will be singing songs he will be merrily and joyous and this will pass to fastly and this stage of life will pass to fastly next is the role of a soldier here in this stage fit aggressive short tempered and ambitious he endangers his life for seeking a fame as a soldier okay next the fifth stage is it shows the maturity and wisdom of a family man means a family man a middle aged man here he will be having a round belly and the next is the sixth stage here he will become very old and weak when he reaches the sixth stage in the 60s his voice won't be clear 
he is going to the second stage of his childhoodness or his second childishness here his voice won't be clear with the loss of his teeth and the final stage is most miserable one here he has become very weak and old okay and this ends the strange eventful history okay here in this poem in this play shakespeare william shakespeare refers the world as a stage and all the men and women are the players of the play here players on the stage and they will be playing the role of they will be playing seven roles in their life one is a sorry infant second is child third is soldier sorry lover fourth is soldier fifth is a middle aged man sixth is an old man okay and seven the and sorry the play ends in the seventh stage okay that's all about the poem this poem is draw sorry is, this play is by william shakespeare okay let us take one next chapter today buck to the rescue buck was a magnificent sheep dog sold to men who lived in the icy north of america these men were extremely cruel masters buck was beaten starved and forced to obey them one day when buck had nearly dropped dead from exhaustion he was rescued by an onlooker john thornton sheep dog means uh, a dog who is trained to herd the sheep or the grace to look after the sheep okay now buck was a magnificent sheep dog sold to men who lived in this icy north of america okay buck was a dog who was sold to men sheep dog he was trained to herd the sheep and he he was sold to men who lived in the icy north of america they were very cruel these men were very cruel and they had beaten him and forced him to obey them okay starved means he was not given food for many days and one day he was nearly to nearly dead from exhaustion means severe tiredness and he was saved by an onlooker onlooker means kalchakar his name was john thornton john thornton was alone in the camp with only two dogs for company because he was recovering from the frozen feet and frostbite john was still limping slightly when buck came into his life together the two invalids sat on the river bank through the warm spring days listening to the bird song and watching the sparkling water as they recovered thornton was alone in the camp and he has only two dogs for company because he was having frozen feet means and frostbite frostbite means he was having injuries on the fingers and his toes which was caused by the extreme cold okay and john was still limping slightly limping means he was not able to walk clearly when buck came into his life he was still having the after effects of frostbite means he was in he had injuries on his fingers and toes because of the extreme cold and he was not able to walk clearly and uh, when buck came into his life he was also like then and the together the two invalids invalids means people who cannot move due to illness or disability they were both were ill right buck was beaten and starved and forced to obey them by his previous his former masters and john thornton was having frostbite was suffering from frostbite and both of them were ill and what they do they went to the river bank through the warm spring days they listened to the bird song and watched the sparkling water buckle was able to rest at last after some 3000 miles of travel he regained his lost weight gradually and his coat turned glossy once more skeet a little irish dog had the doctor trait which 
some dog's possess she washed and cleaned bucks wounds like a mother cat washing her kittens at first too weak to object buck soon came to expect and enjoy her attention nick thornton's other dog was friendly too who game buck had suffered a lot from his former farm masters right and at last his he was able to take rest after 3000 miles of travel he had traveled 3000 miles to his new owner new master and he regained his lost weight and he is almost fit now and uh, john thornton's one dog named skid he had chosen irish dog had a doctor trait doctor trait means had the natural quality of doctors that is she cared for other dogs so people who were injured she used to take care of other dogs and the people who were injured she has the ability of that so skeet take to care of buck and she cleaned and washed the buck's wounds like a mother cat washing her kittens it was too weak to object buck soon came to expect and enjoy her attention there was one more dog there nick its name was nick it was also friendly with buck he was amazed at their friendliness and lack of jealousy maybe their master's kindness had rubbed off them off on them too unlike other men he looked after their needs not as if it is was a duty but as if he cared for them like this like his children he never forgot a kindly greeting or a cheering word he did not mind romping or playing ridiculous games with them but but knew for the first time in his life what it was to love and be loved by a man we have already read, read that buck has suffered a lot from his old masters or his former masters now he got two friends and a good master now okay and the two dogs were also very friendly and he was the buck was the dog buck was amazed by seeing the friendliness and lack of jealousy of the two dogs he met new of or the two dogs he that he got now as his friends now uh, their master john tonton was a very good man and they might have seen his kindness and they have learned that too by seeing him and the new master cared the dogs like his own children and he used to play games with the dogs okay now only buck knew what is love and what is to be loved all of buck's pent up feelings of love now seemed to find expression buck's love for tronton was shown in adoration he went wild with happiness when tronton tonton patted him but unlike ski tonic he wouldn't ask for affection now his love was buried inside him buck's love was buried inside him why his masters were very cruel now only he was able to express his feelings of love and um, how he cared him back buck cared tonton or oh, he showed his love by caring or oh, affection and he used to play with him he loves when tonton patted on him this was just not just because tonton had saved his life he was the idol master caring and affectionate Uh, he is not loving him uh, for not only for saving him for not only for saving him by but why he is the ideal master he knows how to take care of others that's why he loves buck loves his new master very much he had a way of taking buck's head roughly inside 
between his large hands and resting his own head on Buck's. Then he would shake Buck's head back and forth. His terms of fiction, fiction would be, You ugly old monster, or you villain of a dog. And Buck delighted in them. And John Taunton had his own ways of showing affection to the dogs. What he used to call him, You ugly old monster, or villain of a dog. And uh, how Buck returned his expression of love, he used to keep Taunton's hand in his mouth and bite it. He know what they both are doing it because they love each other. They both of them know what they are doing. What they are doing because of love. Okay, they care for themselves, right? As um, he was saved from his old masters, he is worried. He might have, he might lost, he might lose his new master John Taunton. So Buck was always worried. He never wanted John Taunton to get away out of his sight. Now, after when during the night while he was sleeping, what he will do if he feels like uh, he will lose him. He would get up and he will go near the tent of John Thornton and he will listen to him breathing. Okay. Despite this great love for Thornton, Buck was still a creature of the wild and cold steel and act with great cunning. Actually, it is a wild dog. So, he has trained like that. So, for the scars of many fights with fierce dogs, he would be, he could be merciless with strange dogs recognizing that no mercy could be shown under the law of cub and fang. He was trained to herd the sheep, right? So he was trained to uh, fight with other dogs who comes to uh, attack the sheep. So what he do? He was trained, so he, as he was trained like that, he used to attack other dogs. He will be showing only love to the new friends of him, two dog friends of him and his new master. It was only Thornton had that held him. All other men did not matter. When Hans and Pete, Thornton's partners returned back, Buck only tolerated them for her sake. Uh, he only He only showed his affection towards John Thornton. He tolerated his friends Hans and Pete when they came to visit him. In the autumn of the year, Buck saved Thornton's life. Thornton and his partners were taking a long narrow boat down a stream that led to a waterfall. Suddenly Thornton got drawn, thrown into the water and was carried downstream to almost certain death. Okay, in one autumn, when Thornton and his partners, who are they? Hans and Pete. They went for where boating. So he was thrown to the water near and was carried down to a waterfall. And he was almost dead. Buck dived into the stream at once and pulled Thornton out of the water. When he left Thornton grasp his tail, he began swimming towards the bank with his splendid strength. When and what happened, Buck tried to save, save Thornton. He dived into the streams and pulled Thornton out of the water. And when he felt that Thornton has grasped his tail, he began swimming toward the bank by taking his complete strength with his complete strength but the pull of the downward current was too strong and John knew that heading to the shore was impossible he clutched onto the rock for dear life and shouted above the roar of the water go bug go no it was very strong the water was flowing very strong so John knew that it will be impossible for them to reach the bank. So what happened? 
so he clutched on to a dock rock and he told buck and he shouted buck to go there from there when buck heard his master's voice he raised his head head above the water and obediently swam towards the bank then when he heard uh, john tonston shouting go buck go he left there and he raised his head above the water and he swam towards the bank and he saw hans and peter was there on the shore they tied a rope around buck's neck and shoulders and back he went to the river and what they did they tied a rope around buck's neck and shoulders and he dived back swam back to the water risking his life and making two attempts he finally managed to reach thornton and get him back to safety with thornton clinging desperately to him as he pulled and he rescued thornton from there thornton who himself was badly hurt went carefully over buck's body when he found three broke broken ribs he announced that settles it we camp right here and camp they did till buck was well enough to travel buck became famous for his exploit in all of alaska okay and what happened he saved him he went on buck's body to the shore and he found at last he found there were three broken ribs buck has broken three ribs of him and they came there until he was well enough to travel and the heroism he did to save the honor his new master john thorno thornton has became very famous in alaska okay the story is adapted from the call of the wild by jack london was written by jack london okay this is all about the story how buck was rescued from his masters and about his new master john thornton and how buck rescued him back from drowning okay that's all about the story okay next is a poem ring out wild bells take page number 29 Ring out wild bells to the wild sky the flying cloud the frosty night light the ear of dying in the night ring out wild bells and let them die ring out the old ring in the new ring happy bells across the snow the ear is going let him go ring out the false ring in the new ring in the true ring out the grief that saps the mind for those that here we see no more ring out the fate of rich and poor ring in dread redress to all mankind ring out a slowly dying cause and ancient forms of party strife ring in the nobler modes of life with sweeter manners purer laws okay on reading the title of the poem it tells that it is ring the bells to welcome the new and say goodbye to the old flying cloud and frosty light lies the cold and windy winter evening year is ending is dying in the night implies it is the new year eve right poet is telling that telling the reader that to flow away the falsehood away the falsehood and to start a new beginning the third stanza is an entreaty to the mankind in general it tells that to pend up the sorrow that we had for the lost one from our life now they are resting in peace so we have to pend up the sorrow uh, for those who are no more with us and he, the poet tells that the quarrel between the rich and the poor must be done away and the whole people must be together rectify together their past mistakes and they have to 
put an end to the class differences. Right says that all the older conflicts must be forgotten and to start a new beginning in their life in the new year. Every person would be must be good to each other and should not do any harmful things to others. All in all, the poet tells the reader to forget about the past and to start a new beginning in the new life, new year. Okay, they have to forget the conflicts that had in their past. And they have to forget that and you will have to move together. The people have to move together. And that's all what the poet means in the poem. To get a, to start a fresh beginning. And to forget all the things and conflicts that happened in the first past okay okay now take page number 32 the next chapter is the terrific saurian combat a german professor otto lieben Lidenbrock believes the earth's core is not very liquid but solid and moderate in temperature he is convinced there are volcanic tubes going toward the center of the earth he, his nephew, Axel, and their guide Hans descend into the chimney of an extinct volcano near Reykjavik, Iceland. The three travelers set off into the bubbles of the earth, encountering many adventures and great dangers, including prehistoric animals and natural hazards before eventually coming to the surface again in southern Italy at the Stromboli volcano. Axel keeps a diary. In his, this extract, they witness a combat between monstrous sea creatures. Okay, this is about a German professor. What was his name? Otto Lidenbrock. Now, his believes that the earth's core, means the central part of the earth, the center of the earth, is not a fairy liquid. And he believes it is solid. It is moderate in temperature. He is convinced there are volcanic tubes going toward the center of the earth. Now, he is convinced that there are volcanic tubes that are going toward the center of the earth. He, his nephew Axel and their guide Hans descend into the chimney of an extinct volcano near Reykjavik, Iceland. Fallen downwards to the chimney of an extinct volcano means the volcano that has erupted around in thousand years in where Reykjavik, Iceland. And both of the three, sorry, and the three travelers set off into the bowels of the earth means the innermost part of the earth they had faced many adventures they had to undergo many adventures and great dangers and they had to meet prehistoric animals and natural hazards before eventually coming to the surface again in southern Italy now uh, before reaching the back to the surface they had to maze, face many adventures and dangers axel keeps a diary in this extract they witness a combat between now monstrous sea creatures combat means a battle they okay. here axel means uh, the german professor otto lidenbrock's nephew had kept a diary with him and he has written the about the battle between them, them and the monstrous three creatures. Tuesday, August 18th, evening came at last. The hour when the need for sleep caused our eyelids to be heavy. There is no night, not properly speaking, in this place any more than there is in summer in the Arctic regions. Hans, however, is steady at the rudder. When he rests, I really cannot say. I take advantage of his 
alternates to take a little rest. Rudder means it's a flat piece of wood or a metal at the back of the boat. And it is going to move from side to side to control the direction of the travel. So, an evening on Tuesday, August 18th, um, it was the time for sleep. It has, it caused the day eyelids so heavy. And they were known, night and proper speaking, they had come, undergone many adventures. So, they were not speaking, even speaking properly. Okay, in the many Arctic regions, it is summer means it will it will be. It is summer in the Arctic regions. How Hans, who was the guide, he was taking rest. He was steady at the rudder. He was taking rest on the rudder. But two hours later, I was awakened from the heavy sleep by an awful shock. The raft appeared to have struck upon a sunken rock. It was lifted right out the out of the water by some astonishing and mysterious power, and then thrown off twenty fathoms distant. The two of us who awakened Axel awakened by hearing a by an awful shock. What happened? The raft has struck upon a sunken rock. It was lifted right out of the water by some astonishing and mysterious power. They were uh, lifted right out of the water by some astonishing and mysterious power. And they had thrown 20 fathoms. It is a uh, measuring unit of measuring the depth of water. They are thrown away. 20 fathoms distant. Hey, what is it? cried my uncle starting up. Are we shipwrecked or what? And uncle means the German professor Otto Lidenbrock is shouting as they or they has ja damaged or is their damage ship has damaged. Hans raised his hand and pointed to where about 200 yards off. A large black mass was moving up and down. I looked at it with awe. My worst fears were confirmed. And when he was asking that, Hans raised his hand and pointed to somewhere. And there was a black, large black was mass moving up and down. And he was shocked by seeing that. It is a colossal monster. I cried, clasping my hands. Colossal means it's a great monster. Yes, cried the agitated professor. Agitated means nervous because of worry or fear. And the professor was also agitated. It is a huge sea lizard of terrible size and shape. What was that? What is the thing that has thrown their boat or raft? It was a huge sea lizard and further on look on enormous crocodile look at his hide his sauce and that row of monstrous teeth how oh, he has gone I said and what did he say it also looks like a crocodile it has ugly jaws again okay, monstrous teeth a whale, a whale, shouted the professor. I can see her enormous fins. See, see how she blows air and water. Now, they thought, first thought that it is a huge sea lizard. Then they thought it is a crocodile. Then he thought it is a whale because he has seen fins. And she is blowing air and water. Two liquid columns rose to a vast height above the level of the sea. And then fell in May with a terrific crash, creating awful echoes. We stood still, surprised, terror stricken at the sight of this group of fearful marine monsters. They were more dreadful in reality than in my dreams. They were enormous. The smallest of the whole party could have easily crushed our raft and us with a single bite. Now, 
what this so two liquid columns rose to a vast height before the level of the sea and then fell with a terrific crash they have seen something else they were very surprised and they were in great fear by seeing this creature okay seizing the rudder which had flown out of his hand turned it violently trying to escape from danger but things became worse in front was a turtle about 40 feet wide and a serpent quite as long which an enormous with an enormous ugly head peering out from the waters what was there uh, hands was seizing the rudder which is uh, used to uh, correct the location of the sorry the direction of the raft and but ha- what happened they were in danger but the situation became very worse they had seen a turtle and a serpent with an ugly head which were with we looked it was impossible for us to flee the fearful reptiles moved towards us they turned and were twisted about the raft with dreadful speed they formed a series of circles around our vessel i looked up i took up my rifle in desperation but what effect can a rifle bullet produce when upon the scales of these horrid monsters there are a lot of monstrous animals or sea creatures around their boat and he took his rifle bullet rifle and he was hopeless being hopeless he took out his rifle but he can't do anything with his rifle bullet he we remained still and dumb from utter horror they advanced upon us nearer and nearer our fate appeared certain fearful and terrible no one sighed the mighty crocodile on the other the great sea serpent the rest of the fearful crowd of marine monsters has plunged beneath and the salty waves had disappeared means to us a crocodile on the other side one side and sea serpent on the other side and the rest of the marine monsters were fallen uh, and disappeared into the waves I was about to fire at any risk. Hans, however, stopped me with a sign. The two monsters passed within fifty fathoms or er of the raft and then made a rush at one another. Furry and rage preventing them from seeing us. Now, what happened? They too passed fifty fathoms from the raft and then. they made a rush at each other means they came towards harry towards each other ready to attack combat commenced we could see distinctly every action of the two monsters but to my excited imagination other animals seemed about to take part in the fierce and deadly struggle the monster the whale the lizard and the turtle i could see them i pointed them out to the icelander but he only shook his head in what happened the other monster animals also took part in the deadly struggle and now he said twa what two only does he say surely he is mistaken i cried in a tone of wonder now he told there is only two but now he is uh, surprised to hear that he is quite right replied my uncle coolly examining the terrible dwarf with his telescope and speaking as if he is as he he were in a lecture room he was examining the fight within the monsters monstrous uh, sea creatures and he told his right there is only two and he is asking how is it possible yes it is so the first of those monsters had the snout of the porpoise snout means the part of an animal set containing the nose and jaws okay the head of a lizard the teeth of a crocodile and this this that has deceived us it is the most fearful of all prehistoric reptiles the world renowned ichthyosaurus ichthyosaurus or the great fish lizard and the other 
The other is a monstrous serpent concealed under the hard domed shell of the turtle. It is the Plesiosaurus or the sea crocodile. And what are they? First one is the great fish lizard and the second one is the sea crocodile. Okay. Hans was quite right. Only two monsters disturbed the surface of the sea. Possibly for the first time, human eyes had gazed upon two reptiles of the great primitive ocean. I saw the flaming red eyes of the Ichthyosaurus, each as big or bigger than a man's head. It were, has sometimes been called a whale, for it is as big and quite quick as so quick in its movements as a king of the seas. This one measured not less than a hundred feet in length, and I could form some idea of his breadth. Okay, now they are uh, telling it is the which one? The great fish lizard is the most fearful of the uh, prehistoric reptiles. Let's notice the eyes of the Theosaurus. It was bigger than a man's head. Okay. They are looking how both of the creatures look like and they are explaining it. These animals attacked one another with unimaginable fury. They raised mountains of water which dashed in a spray over the raft, which was already tossed to and fro by the waves. Twenty times we seemed on the point of being upset and hurled headlong into the waves and now they see they saw the uh, creatures attacking each other they are making mountains of water they are raising mountains of water just fine his is carried terror in a, to our hearts awful combatants were so close i could not make out one from this other Still the battle could not last forever, but despite whoever was the victor, we were in danger. They are terrifying hissing sounds. His means the sound that is made by a snake. His you might have learned that. Okay, they are terrifying hissing sounds made terror in their hearts. You can see that in the picture. Yes, they are in danger. One or two hours, three hours passed by without any result. The struggle continued with the same deadly violence. The opponents constantly same clo came close and then drew away from the raft. Once or twice we fancied they were about to leave us altogether, but instead of that, they came nearer and nearer. They thought it will be over in no time. But have what happened? Even after three hours has passed by, they continued their deadly violence. Okay thought that they will go far away but they came nearer and nearer we crouched on the raft they were ready to fire at them at a moment's notice though there was not much hope of hurting them still we were determined not to perish without a struggle the ichthyosaurus and the plesiosaurus disappeared beneath the waves leaving behind them a maelstrom in the midst of the sea, we were nearly drawn by, down by the whirlpool. Several minutes went by before anything was again seen. Was this wonderful struggle to end in the depths of the ocean? Was the last act of the struggle drama to take place without spectators? It was impossible for us to say. Now, they uh, thought of firing them, but they were not having much hope on hurting them. And what they did, they well, don't want to die like that. Okay, now what happened? They disappeared. The two strange monsters disappeared under the waves. And there was a whirlpool in the middle of the sea. And after some minutes, what happened? Nothing happened. They were not seen again. Suddenly, at no great distance from us, an enormous mass rises out of the waters. The head of the great Plesiosaurus, the terrible monster, was now fatally wounded. I could see nothing now of his enormous body. All that could be distinguished was his serpent-like neck, 
which he twisted and curled in all the agonies of death. Now he struck the waters with it as if it had been a gigantic whip and then again wriggled like a worm cut into two. Soon the end of the beast approached nearer and nearer. His movements slowed down. At last the body of the mighty snake lay in dead mass on the surface of the low, calm and placid waters. As for the ichthyosaurus, had he gone to the mighty cavern under the sea to rest, or would he reappear to destroy us? This question remained unanswered. Answered, but for the moment we had breathing time. And what happened? They saw uh, the plesiosaurus was dead. It was fatally wounded, and they saw it dead on the um, surface of the water. And they are now they are thinking, well, the ichthyosaurus will come back to destroy them. Okay. Now this is a story I've adapted from the journey to the center of the earth by Jules Verne. It is about the their journey to the center of the earth and the adventures they faced during their journey.